Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome. My name is Mercedes Witowski. I'm the Executive Director at the New Jersey Council on Developmental Disabilities. For those of you who are not familiar uh, with the Council, we are authorized within the Federal Developmental Disabilities Act, and our purpose is to help individuals and families participate in the design of their services and supports and assist individuals and families advocate um, gain access to the services and supports that they need um, and live a self-determined, independent, productive life in the community. Um, as executive director on the, of the council and on behalf of the NJCDD, we are pleased to provide a level of funding for this conference series through a community innovation project and very grateful to the Collaborative for Citizen Directed Services in submitting an application to resurrect this conference. We're also very grateful to the many hours of volunteer efforts in bringing these sessions about. I want to especially thank tonight's panelists for prioritizing this session in your busy schedules and to all of you that have joined and those that will watch this session in the future. Um, I also want to share with you that I am a single parent of two children. My 32 year old daughter, Tina, became disabled after she suffered a massive stroke when she was 16 years old. Uh, Tina lives at home with me and benefits from the many uh, services and supports that we'll hear about tonight. So what can you expect tonight? Um, this session is dedicated to an overview of the various stakeholders in the self-direction space. Um, we'd like you to meet individuals, families, and system professionals, and a self-directed employee who utilize and work in self-direction um, and hear from those um, throughout this session and then um, later this week, part two of this session, uh, we'll, I'll say dive deeper, dig deeper into um, the topics we'll hear about tonight. Um, th the part two session on Thursday, will have five sessions that will run from noon until 6 p.m. You can register for all or uh, selected sessions in that, in that, that series of five. Um, the topics are recruiting, hiring, and managing SDEs, selecting supports and services, understanding the FI model options, supports brokerage services, and supports coordination services. And then there'll be four additional sessions after this week's part one and two, and again, You'll be able to dig even deeper. Um, there'll be an evening uh, at the end of the month where it'll be uh, totally your turn to ask questions with a variety of system partners on hand. So tonight's session is set up as a Zoom webinar session with only panelists in view, since this is mostly a listening session. Um, I'm excited that these sessions are being recorded because they will give you an on-demand reference point in the future. Um, if you're currently even watching tonight, you'll be able to go back and listen in on something or for people who that were not able to join tonight. But it's great to see almost 100 of you um, joining our session tonight. I'm also glad that we're holding this series in March, which is uh, National Disabilities Awareness Month. Um, and um, before we really get started, I wanted to um, frame a, the, the, the conference session um, in a way that I'll quote a woman named Judy Herman. She is an international disability activist. And if you don't know her, um, I would encourage you to check her out. Um, but Judy, which some, Judy said something that um, sticks with me and that is that independent living is not doing things by yourself. It's about being in control of how things are done and being in control of how things are done. So no one has to think of being out there alone. And hence our conference series title, we are all in this together. So to get us started this evening, I'm gonna take a few minutes um, and go through some words that we'll use. Um, we're going to hear the terms self-determination, person-centered planning, and self-direction. I'm gonna to try to provide a little bit of a framework because while these can easily be connected, they do mean different things. So 
if we could think of self-determination as the broader term that describes a person's freedom to choose and set goals and develop dreams about what's important in their lives. And then person-centered planning is a process that's used to help people and those supporting a person with a disability to determine what's important to them, keeping in mind that the person with a disability is at the center of the process. The person-centered planning process helps us to identify the person's strengths, goals, medical needs, uh, paid and unpaid services and supports that they might get and their desired outcomes. And this process, you know, this person-centered planning process helps to develop the plan, goals and objectives to support an individual. Many times there's others supporting the individual. And for example, my daughter asks that I participate in her person-centered planning process and many aspects of how she's determining how to live her life. So someone can lead a self-determined life using the person-centered planning process and set goals with or without using self-directed services. Okay, because self-directed services is a method to achieve self-determination. It's an approach to achieve self-determination because provider managed services can also lead someone to a self-determined life using a planning process to get there. So what's also important to know is that one choice doesn't rule out the other. And I'll share that in my daughter's support system, she has chosen you know, how to spend her time and the goals that she has for herself. And with my assistance, she uses a provider for some of those support needs. And then she uses self-directed services for other support needs. So you can use a combination of the two. So now, now let's dig in a little deeper on what is self-directed services and what is that method or approach. And if you have specific questions about any of these terms, um, if I'm going too fast, if there's some an acronym that any I use or any of the panelists use, please use the Q&A to ask your question. And one of the panelists will be able to respond to you. The chat is, has been disabled in this session because again, it's mostly a listening session, but please we encourage you to use the Q&A. So in this digging deeper on the self-directed services method or the approach, Self-directed services in New Jersey um, is that method that we'll cover in this topic um, and in this conference series. And it's being covered for the services in the DDD system, the supports program or the community care program and the personal care assisted services that can be self-directed through the personal preference program. The ability to self-direct these services provides the individual with increased choice and control over how and from whom they receive their services and supports. So while someone can have more decision-making in this um, model, that also comes with a level of responsibility to manage those supports. And you'll hear more about those additional responsibilities tonight. So there's a number of reasons why individuals decide to self-direct services. And in my experience, typically it's because they want more control on who provides their supports and actually like who they hire to be their support staff. And I hear that a lot. Um, but then also when the support staff are available, the hours of the day, the days of the week, um, that's important to many individuals. And we refer to the staff that provide these supports in the self-directed model as self-directed employees or SDEs. So I've also heard from folks who need staff, you know, very early in the morning, like 6 a.m. And they need them to work until 8 a.m., two hours, and then come back maybe later in the, in the day to help with an evening routine and and getting things um, wound down for the day and prepared for the next day. 
These folks have told me that it's challenging to find agency staff who can work short blocks of time and then be there um, in the morning for that short block and then again later in the day. So self-direction can be a solution for folks needing very specific schedules that don't follow a more typical nine to five weekday schedule. Now that's not to say that agencies cannot provide a varied schedule of staffing, but we hear that it's not as typical and um, sometimes difficult to get that varied schedule. I've also heard from uh, individuals and families who have loved ones that are um, not being supported successfully in a provider managed residential setting. And I wanna point out that the, in the DDD system that self-directed services can be an option to assisting someone in living in an apartment or at home with family uh, with a high degree of support staff and, and support services. So my, my longstanding experience is that when a person decides to self-direct and to hire their own staff, they also often pull from a different pool of candidates um, than agency providers might pull from. And what I mean by that is um, self-directing employees are often family members, neighbors, friends, people who typically may not work for an agency and aren't traditional staff in, in the provider pool. So in effect, this model you know, really is important in also expanding the workforce for people with disabilities. So in self-direction, the fiscal management services or the fiscal intermediary, the FI, are delivered in New Jersey using two different models, the vendor fiscal employer agent model with public partnerships or the agency with choice model with Easter Seals, New Jersey. And just a brief description and distinction about these two models. In the vendor fiscal employer agent model with public partnerships, the individual is the employer of record. PPL services both the personal preference program and the DDD supports program and community care program. And these individuals can have a representative, but it is the individual that serves as the employer of record and PPL acts as the fiscal intermediary or the fiscal agent. In the agency with choice model with Easter Seals, Easter Seals is the employer of record and the individual or their representative is the managing employer. Easter Seals services the DDD supports program, community care program, not the personal preference program. So I'm gonna put a plug in here for a guide that was produced by, the, by DDD uh, and the Bog Center entitled Understanding Self-Directed Services in New Jersey and the Role of the Supports Broker. It's a 24 page guide that provides many excellent details about DDD's self-directed services with charts and graphs and um, a real hold it in your hands uh, ability to read through and look at how the, the self-directed services are laid out as well as the role of the support broker. And I was gonna ask Javier if he could just put that link in the chat. Um, so I hope that in whatever method we use to get the services we need, again, by method I'm referring to self-directed or provider managed, that everyone has selected the approach or the method based on what makes the most sense for them. And if you select one method today, it doesn't take away your ability to switch your method. I know that's not, that sounds easier said than done because it's a lot that goes into um, provider managed and self-directed services. But just, just to point out that you don't get locked into one or the other. And as I mentioned, you have the ability to use both. The other important, important thing to point out is that the self-directed method may not be for everyone. And that's perfectly okay, since it's an option available, and I'm grateful that we live in a state that has more options in self-direction than many other states. And if I heard correctly at the last pre-conference session, New Jersey has the most individuals self-directing services than any other state. So glad we're living here. Does it make the system perfect? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, but we do have more choice and more options. The other important thing to point out 
<clears throat> is that we're mostly talking about the ability to self-direct these federal and state funds. So self-direction doesn't mean getting a blank check. That is not the way self-direction works. There's a level of rules and responsibilities that come along with self-direction. And that's where it can get confusing. And I hope that in this conference series, we're, we're gonna provide information that will help you understand self-direction better and provide resources if this is a method that you either currently use or decide to explore in the future. So as you listen to the conversation with tonight's panelists, please keep in mind that they're sharing their personal and or business related experiences. We wanna give you the opportunity to hear from folks using the system and those providing the various components of self-determination, person-centered planning, and the New Jersey self-directed models. We wanna respect everyone's time and those participating as panelists tonight. So please, again, use the chat, um, use the Q&A, I should say, to seek clarification about the concepts, the services, the definitions that we're discussing. Um, and remember that we do have that dedicated session um, on March 24th, where it's your turn to ask questions. Um, we're not sure that we'll get to many questions tonight, but we will fit in whatever we can. Um, we do only have the 90 minutes um, and we have over a dozen panelists, again, which we're very grateful for. Um, I can assure you though, that the conference planning team will take any of the uh, comments that you put in the chat, um, I'll say it again, in the Q&A and make sure that um, we'll take those into consideration for the remaining sessions this, this month. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Steve Grislavik, um, somebody that I got to meet at a, uh, an S, a self-directed employee uh, bog center conference um, several years ago, and really value your um, contributions, your, your uh, dedication to sharing your experiences with other Steve. Um, so Steve's good, joining us tonight. And Steve, we're going to start this session by asking you to kind of just describe the benefits of self-direction in your life. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak with everyone today. Um, I just wanted to talk briefly about the benefits of um, self-direction in my life. Um, so I put a few notes together. Um, the, the first thing is um, when you have a disability, it's very difficult. Uh, to navigate some of these systems and procedures. And you have to kind of figure out what am I gonna do to make my life as independent um, and as straightforward as possible while receiving the services that I need. Um, so self-direction provided me with a lot of independence um, and a lot of personal choice. Um, I'd be able to choose who I had to come in my house and help me. Um, I'd be able to choose what fiscal model uh, I used to pay that person. Um, I'd be able to choose um, the, and be able to negotiate the rate with the individual. Uh, with a lot of agencies, um, you can't do that if you use an agency uh, model. Um, so it's, it's, it's led to a lot of independence uh, for me. Uh, I also uh, don't do this alone. Uh, I have a tremendous team of people um, that I've been able to hand select uh, to help me navigate uh, these very complex systems. Um, and they help to arrange the uh, services uh, for me. And uh, we, we have discussions, but well, ultimately it's my choice. Um, they're able to give me advice, um, which I take, um, but ultimately at the end of the day, it comes down to the decision that I think is best for me, which you can often do in other models. Um, additionally, uh, I've been very blessed in my life uh, to be able to share my experience with others um, through helping uh, families and individuals uh, navigate this complex system as a consultant. Um, so I'm able to uh, come in and provide education uh, and try to navigate the system for people so that it's not so complicated, and we can meet an end goal. Um, I also was able to do this as a consultant 
for uh, corporate businesses as well and use some self-direction principles uh, in order to help corporate businesses hire individuals with disabilities. Uh, if we would like to talk about uh, um, subject matters such as inclusion for all uh, and making a truly inclusive society, then self-direction uh, is truly one of the main principles uh, to use. And I, I really hope uh, that this movement continues um, and that we can make an inc inclusive society for all. Well, Steve, um, again, you just always impress me um, with you know how you how you frame um, and and share your life experience. Um, can you can, you know when you talk about um, you know getting advice and now it sounds like also you're giving advice. Is there something um, that stands out the most to you? The people ask you about. Um, you know, that come to you for advice or the advice that you've been given? Is there, is there a top, you know, um, tidbit or piece of advice that you can share with us? Um, I think uh, the, the first thing is uh, choice really matters um, and individuals really need multiple choices and multiple options um, to look at. Um, I don't think there's a one size fits all system for disability. Uh, I think many people do it differently. Um, people, people do it uh, in a way that works for them. So that's important. Um, but the, the most important thing that I think people should really focus on is what is best for the individual? What is going to be the best outcome for the individual? How are they gonna live the most independent, uh, fulfilling life? Um, you know, cause that, as we all know, uh, society is really hard, so let's try to make it a little easier for people. Yeah, Steve, I hear you on that one. And, you know, I guess when you also talk about choice, you know, I don't know about you, um, but I know that there's been choices uh, that I've made that aren't maybe the best choice, um, but you have to learn from that choice in order to get to the next choice. Do, do, do you feel the same? Do you Have you found any situations yeah. where... Maybe and the first the, choice wasn't the best choice. The, the, great, the great thing about the self-directed model is if something does not work, um, you, can, you can always, almost always go back and choose something different. Or if you have a change in circumstance, um, your disability changes, uh, you need more assistance. There's always other methods that you can use to uh, try to help yourself and others uh, to make sure you have the most support as possible. Um, so, so it, you know, the, the, the first step is realizing and accepting that you need help. The, the second step is uh, being informed and making sure that you uh, make a, a choice. And if that choice does not work, you can, you can adjust it uh, so that it can work. Thanks, Steve. More great advice. Um, so I really appreciate um, your time. And I know that you're going to stick around in case um, anything comes through that maybe we can follow up with you later in the from the Q&A. So thanks, Steve. Um, so moving along, I'd like to invite um, Anne Martinelli. Um, Anne's got two roles and um, uh, Anne has many roles. Uh, let's start there. But the two roles that Anne is going to help um, us cover tonight is a family member role. Um, and so why don't we start there, Anne? And if you could just kind of talk to us about what's important um, in the self-directed hiring for you and your son, Joe. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, and thanks, everyone, for listening. Um, it wasn't until Joe and I took uh, a two-day training on person-centered thinking and planning that I really began to understand um, self-direction and what it meant to be hiring a self-directed employee. Uh, we began uh, more than 18 years ago, just thinking of ways to fill Joe's day. That's how I looked at uh, what needed to be done when he was leaving the education system. Okay, what are we doing next? Let's, let's figure out how we're gonna fill the day. 
I concentrated on the what's important for peace. And I was laser focused on making sure uh, someone could secure Joe's wheelchair in his van. Someone would keep him healthy and safe. Obviously, that's extremely important. But what I learned during that person-centered thinking uh, training was that there needs to be a balance between what's important to and what's important for, uh, like the wheelchair tie downs. And um, did you watch the Yankees last night? There has to be a balance between the, those two things for, for Joe. Um, I can teach anyone how to do wheelchair tie downs and I'll watch them do it. A new, a new self-directed uh, employee, I'll watch them do it five times or 25 times until I and they um, are comfortable doing it on their own. But I'm not going to be out there when Joe is out and about with the self-directed employee. The self-directed employee has to be able to carry on a conversation with Joe about the Yankees. And it's important that the conversation is detailed about the important plays that were in the game last night and the home runs that were hit. Not just, hey, did you watch the Yankees last night? That was a great game. It has to be a real detailed conversation. So these are the things that are important to Joe. He wants people to support him. And also he, the people he wants to support him, he wants them to be enjoying the same things that he does, um, like the Yankees and music on the boardwalk or at a downtown Freehold concert here in Monmouth County. They're important to Joe. And these are the questions that he has asked when we interview someone together. He'll ask them what their interests are. He wants to align interests. Um, he and I need to know that their time spent together will include shared interests and fun conversations. It's important to Joe that those who support him also share their lives with him. He wants to hear about their weekend activities and their families. Joe has actually accompanied two of his past support staff to purchase engagement rings for their girlfriends a few years apart, um, and he attended both of their weddings. So it's important to Joe to share these type of things with those who support him. And while those two young men are no longer paid to support Joe, they're still in his life. Um, one regularly FaceTimes Joe just to chat and has stopped at our home unexpectedly when he was in the area. From my perspective, I also want self-directed employees to feel comfortable telling me new ideas, particularly about fun things to do. Since Joe's self-directed employees have always been close to his age, they're gonna have different ideas on what fun things to do are you know, happening in the area. Um, I also find it very important to let self-directed employees know that they're valued members of our team and things that they observe about Joe outside of the home are extremely important to share with Joe and with me um, in, in conversation with both of us. Um, this is a team effort and it's not just about putting the hours in and filling out timesheets. They teach me and remind me that I may know Joe best, but that I don't know everything about him. So it's important that these self-directed employees um, are part of Joe's life, you know, not, not just there filling out a timesheet and, and getting paid for the hours they spend with him. Well, thanks. Um, yes, and you know, you bring up the, the critical aspect of building relationships. Um, and that doesn't happen overnight, but no. you can't get to build a relationship unless you've selected a person to build a relationship with. And I think that, that, that that's what I hear, um, you know, you, you, as, you, as you're talking about, you know, that's precious to, to have that relationship um, and not have services that are just robotic. Um, and, and so, so Joe has those relationships now, he's built them, he's got a team that supports him that way and self-direction helped you get to that point. I'm sorry, I, you kind of so broke there. Self, the is it self-direction that help, has helped get you to yes. that point? Yes, it, it's, it's, it's the, you know, the, those principles in person-centered thinking and planning about, about building relationships, shared interests, making that balance between what's important 
and what's important for the person, the health and safety. You know, if, if everything was focused on one or the other, things are going to happen that aren't going to work. Um, right. But but having that um, healthy healthy balance um, between the two uh, is what makes it worse work. And and the shared interests um, is what makes in, and develops those relationships. Well, thanks, Anne. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna put one of your other hats on here, and that's the hat as the managing employer in um, in in Joe's uh, plan. So. As that managing employer, um, how do you keep track of his schedule and the hours that are available to him? And I think Joe has multiple um, programs that he uh, draws staff from. So how do you make sure that those multiple programs um, don't get confusing and don't cross over? Um, well, uh, yeah, he is. He is does use two programs, but um, uh, it's it's a little different for both, obviously, you know, the personal preference program and the DDD um, uh, piece that he uses are different. Um, at one point, Joe did have seven part-time self-directed employees um, through uh, DDD, using his DDD budget. Um, so I'm gonna really focus on that piece because the personal preference piece, he only has one one person and and that's uh, you know a live-in person here um his dad so um i'm going to focus more on the ddd piece but you're right i do have to balance you know the two the two sets of uh the two sets of um hours um and making sure no there's no overlap but i do that um and like i said at one point in time joe did have seven part-time self-directed employees and he did something different each day um, seven days a week, often seeing two different self-direct employees on the same day. Sometimes he would even see three on the same day. So uh, obviously that involves a lot of hours um, trying to keep, uh, on, you know, his, his day, the hours separated and who did what on what day. So what we did was we bought a large, um, really very simple, common sense. We bought a large uh, desktop calendar and mounted it on the back of our door, the kitchen door where the self-directed employees, um, they enter and leave our home each day. Uh, we're very lucky that either my husband or I can be at home when someone arrives and leaves each day. So at the top of each date, I would write what Joe would be doing that day. Um, you know, is he volunteering, taking a class, shopping, going out with friends, going to an outdoor concert? And although each day was different, each Monday would usually be the same. Each Tuesday would usually be the same. So I used a different color marker for each person and noted the time they arrived and left each day. And, and then at the end of the week, I would total each person's hours and mark it with their designated colored marker. Um, and when I needed to approve and sign a person's timesheet, I had an accurate number of hours that were worked. Um, now, Joe has uh, one full-time employee and one part-time employee, so it is a lot easier. Um, and I just use the notes on my phone, the notes app on my phone, um, and fill in, you know, who checked in, who checked out, uh, and, and just mark, mark it in there. And then when I need to approve a timesheet, I can check uh, my notes for accurate hours. Um, I also use a monthly uh calendar template. Um, and I update it each month with the classes Joe now takes either in person or online, uh, the days he volunteers and the days and times of his in-home therapy sessions. I print it out and I give a copy to Joe's two current self-directed employees to they, for them to keep wherever they want to keep it in their car, where they live. Um, and so they know what's happening each day of the week, uh, even if they're not with him. Um, and I also keep one of them on the back door of the kitchen where I used to keep that big, that big, large that calendar. But I also each month uh, review with Joe the activities um, and talk to him about his continued interest level. You know, does he still want to volunteer at the Habitat, Habitat for Humanity Restore on Fridays? Does he still want to do it weekly? Or does he maybe want to do it twice a month? Um, you know, what are you thinking about for the summer? The Monmouth County uh, Park System just released 
the other day talking about, you know, is there something you want to do uh, this summer, you know, a, 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 like a three hour class or something. So we also look at the local high school's baseball schedule, see if there's some games that are being played on afternoons that might fit into his schedules. And then we just add that to whatever monthly schedule we have. I can change it online, you know, on the template in my notes. Um, and we just tack it up to the back of the kitchen door again. So somebody's always, whoever's here, whoever's in the home can look at it and know exactly what's going on. Yes, it, it's work. It takes time. It takes time to figure it out. Um, but, you know, that that's that's what works for us and, and it works well. Well, and, you know, you're describing a very busy life for Joe, um, very full uh, life with lots of things that he enjoys doing. And you've found the way to manage all that and bring all that together. Um, and you make it kind of sound simple. I'm sure it's not simple, but once you get into the groove, I have to yeah. imagine it's something that then just becomes part yes. of the routine. Yes. So that's terrific, Anne. Um, thanks for sharing that. And Anne, Anne's a wealth of, of information. And um, I'm always grateful when she gets to talk to families because you do make something sound, sound um, like it's doable. So thank you, Anne. Thanks for bringing that to us tonight. Okay, so next up, I'm going to invite uh, Patty Kowalczyk and Steve Rusin of Royal Community Support. And um, they're gonna to talk to us about circle members or circles of support. Um, because as circle of support facilitators and members, um, they're, what we're hoping is that they'll share with us the kind of the critical components in creating and sustaining a circle of support because it takes more than one person to make all this work. So Steve, Patty, thank you for being with us and bring us your knowledge. Well, thanks very much. And I agree with your comments, Mercedes, about Anne. It's always nice to uh, speak in the same context with her because as a mom, she understands the importance of the relationship piece um, as well. And I think that that's kind of really inherent in the whole idea of circles of support. So when we think about, you know, what's, what is paramount and, and critical about having a circle of support, it's really the, the intention and purpose, taking the time to say, why are we doing this? Um, and I think that, you know, for, for people um, who come into the service system as adults with DDD services, it can kind of be compared to kind of moving into a new neighborhood. So when you, when you start using division services, you have to decide, you know, what are, the, what are the things that I need? And the focus is obviously on paid services, um, as it should be. It's very important. People need paid services. They're critical to support. Um, but then it's just like moving into that new neighborhood, you kind of, you figure out where your doctors are that you're gonna use, you're figuring out where the stores are, where you're gonna buy your stuff. You kind of get that baseline figured out of kind of what do I need? What's, in, what's important for me? And then it goes into the, but what else is there? And for many of us, when, when we've had that occasion of moving, it's kind of, well, what else? Where are the friendships? Where are the connections? Uh, what do I like to do? Where are the places in my community that I can find to do those things? Um, and I think that that's where a circle of support comes in um, because you want to kind of look at um, how, do I, how do I make the most of, of where I am and who I've got? So paid uh, support people in some cases can actually be really helpful in helping to develop that circle of support. Um, and I also want to just say quickly, I think sometimes when people have talked to um, uh, us about circles of support, they have that understanding that's about the circle of support that some people learn about in school, where you have kind of this, it's about boundaries and you have like the paid supports out here and then their intimate supports. And really when we're talking about circles of supports, we're talking about support networks. Um, who, who are the people that truly are kind of in there because you care? Um, and it takes time. Uh, it takes time to identify who those people are, how you want to invite them in, um, and the way to do that, which all takes, takes you know, different levels of skill and different level of interest. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that really, 
It's about wanting to make that connection. Um, and we all have disability or not disability, we all have those circles. Um, so really the starting point I think is what's the purpose? What's the intention? Um, and at the end of the day, for any of the circles that, that I've been involved in, it's always come down to, well, the purpose is to have friendships and to have support and to know that someone's got my back. Um, and without those, uh, life could be lonely. And in some cases, life, people can be at risk. So, you know, starting it's kind of why, you know, why would we do this? And um, I think I think the answer is, is comes up pretty clearly. So, and I know Steve, you're gonna talk a little bit more about kind of some specifics around that. Yes, thank you, Patty. So I'd like to talk to you about the importance of being skillful in both the design and facilitation of circles. The first step is to think about who to invite into the circle. What you don't want to do is invite someone to join the circle to be Johnny's friend. That promotes charity and defeats the purpose of a circle since it's not about that. You'll want to think about with Johnny, of course, why someone might be good, be a good circle member and being strategic in inviting them. You might want, you might be having the initial circle to celebrate a birthday, maybe a job, maybe a new apartment, or maybe to watch a Colts game. Um, the next step is the thing about intention. You want to be specific about what you're asking a member to commit to. In my case, if I was going to make a circle about myself, I'm a big Indianapolis Colts fan. So I might consider, um, you know, do I want people to show up to the first quarter of a Colts game at my apartment versus coming to Applebee's for the entirety of the game? Those are two separate situations. One obviously is a time commitment. The other one is a financial commitment. Um, obviously hosting a game at my apartment is going to probably be cheaper than having people go to Applebee's, which might affect, you know, who shows up and, and whatnot. People also want to know what they're getting into and you want them thinking about how to get their feet wet without thinking they are making a lifetime commitment, which is very important. There are three different people, um, here are three different, very people, ah, sorry, here are three different people with very different types of circles. Um, the first example I want to give you is this woman named Jen. Jen's circle consisted of people who previously worked with her over the years. Jen communicated to her circle that she wanted to expand her social network and meet new people, especially people who are not to pay to be in her life. The facilitator of her circle asked Jen if she wanted to have a potluck party, perhaps like a competition, where each person would bring their favorite dish. The role of the facilitator also communicated to everyone that the potluck party was not a charity event, but rather an opportunity for people to show off their cooking skills um, with obviously the intention of expanding Jen's social network. Um, and obviously it also became an opportunity for everyone in the circle to critique one another's culinary sets, you know, for better or for worse. Um, another example could be Kurt's circle. His circle formed during the middle of the height of the pandemic. Kurt wants to create a circle because he wants to work through some things that made him feel isolated because of COVID. His circle began with inviting mostly people who work for him in different roles. The circle would meet over Zoom and Kurt would more or less facilitate with assistance on what he wanted to discuss. Because of COVID, Kurt didn't feel like he had much connection with people and the circle was a way for him to temporary, to feel temporarily connected in an unconventional way. But the good news is that Kurt wants to get off Zoom and start meeting in person. Um, the last example I wanna give you is Brock's circle. So Brock's circle looks completely different than both Jen and Kurt's circle. Brock Circle helped him figure out where he wanted to move out uh, since he wanted to get out of his parents' house. Brock is someone who doesn't like to make decisions but wants to be in control of his life, which obviously is very understandable and very relatable, I think, to everyone. The Circle consisted of people Brock wanted to invite that he trusted and would help him figure out life, what his life after his parents' house could be. Brock also doesn't like meetings but luckily prefers social gatherings with food and music. The circle would meet and spend maybe about five to 10 minutes at a time asking Brock to think about various potential living situations that include everything from location to his expectations on what it would feel like to, you know, who would be there with him um, in terms of staff. Does he want a roommate? Um, does he want his parents? How often do you, does he want his parents coming in and out? Because um, nobody wants their parents, you know, always living with them. So they're pretty big questions. And then after, you know, we'd have those, those questions with him, we'd have, you know, the party would begin. So basically, I just wanted to show you kind of three examples of uh, very different ways in which you can conduct a circle. No two circles are exactly alike, and their true uniqueness reflects in the individualism of the person. Yeah. Thanks. 
And Pat, I'm sorry, go ahead, Patty. I just, I just wanted to add that I think that it's important to note that circles will ebb and flow over time. They change, they're, they're never, it's just like our own lives where people come in and out, everybody's life is different and that's important. And also that in, in developing a circle, if you're helping someone develop a circle, it's really important that that person whose circle it is has an understanding of their role. They're not just the object of everybody coming in, but also forming re reciprocity in those relationships. So knowing, you know, a simple example is knowing the circle members' birthdays and reaching out on their birthday. How's your birthday? Or somebody has a baby, like, hey, great, you know, um, so that it's really kind of a, a, an interactive support system where the members of the circle feel like they get as much support from being part of it as, as the person whose circle was formed around. So thanks. Thanks, Patty and Stephen. I'm going to just, I'm going to add one other question onto this and don't want to put you on the spot, but we, we also hear from folks who say, you know, how will this self-directed service model live on past me? You know, who's going to do this when I'm gone? Can you tell us if, 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 if the circle of support can become something that lives on beyond the, you know, the parent maybe, or, or the, the, the person who's kind of in control or in, helping the person the most today how much time we got <laughs> uh, we don't have a lot of time you have, you have 30 seconds to answer that question patty probably maybe we should have started but is it a solution in any in 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 people's lives can it be a solution i i think if someone wants to i mean how many parents have we talked to that says what's going to happen when i'm gone right. and if, if the answer is not having people in your life or in your family member's life who are daughter son's life who are not paid to be there who are going to be there rain or shine who are going to show up when other people don't i mean that is the answer that's what keeps us all safe so absolutely it takes time but just having you know even starting with one person who's like, yeah, I'm here, things can build from there. And, you know, literally people are safer when they have those connections in their life. So yeah, it can sustain it. Oh, absolutely. Thanks, Patty. Thanks, Steve. Um, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to move into the, some other people that can kind of help sustain things. And those are the, um, uh, the supports within the, the system in the PPP system and in the DDD system. And we're gonna start with the role of the PPP consultant. Um, and I think Donna Sherman and Rachel Ginnenbaum are gonna help us. You know, uh, I'm just curious, what's the most frequently asked question about how PPP works? And, you know, what does the consultant um, do to help support that PPP program participant? or their representative in, in understanding the PPP program. Donna, Rachel. Yeah, thank you, Mercedes. Um, I, you know, we get asked by new folks as well as existing participants in the program of the personal preference program. How do I get started? How is my employee paid? Who determines the budget? Am I responsible for taxes? So I just wanna break that down a little bit. Um, how do I get started is, in the PPP program is you must have a prescription from your medical provider for personal care assistance services required for longer than six months. Once you have that, you can reach out to your managed care coordinate, managed care organization. There are five in New Jersey um, and you can request a PCA assessment. And once your assessment is complete, your managed care organization will provide an options counseling session at this time, the managed care coordinate, the managed care organization will talk to you about the personal preference program and other options for obtaining home health services. And if you opt to engage with the personal preference program, your managed care coordinator will send you a referral and schedule an initial visit where we can go over the program, help identify what you need to be successful in the program and provide tips on how to hire an employee. So PPL works hand in hand with the MCO. They started off and then they hand it over to us. And then how is my employee paid? When your employee submits hours through the time for care application through PPL, um, which is through our better online web portal, um, telephony or paper timesheets, public partnerships will process the timesheets and pay your employees as long as their timesheet meets the program rules. 
very similar to AVP, your consultant will also be able to, and that's another payroll organization, um, your, your uh, consultant will be able to help you work on any denied timesheet reasons. Your employee will be able to select their desired way of getting paid, either by paper checks, direct deposit, or an AVP card. So I'm going to, I'm going to, so you don't have to listen to me talk the entire time. I'm going to hand it off to Rachel to answer, you know, who determines the budget and am I responsible for taxes? And then I'll just like wrap it up after that. All right. Thank you, Donna. So I'm going to handle who determines the budget. So the managed care organization determines the budget amount based on an assessment for the personal care assistance services. They will complete the assessment with you prior to you being referred to the program. They determine the level of services needed, which would then be converted into your monthly budget. You would then be able to engage in both budget authority, which basically allows you to make decisions about your budget and how best you want that to be used. And then also um, you are engaged as the employer authority, which means that you are making decisions about who you want to hire, uh, how you want to train them and inform them as to what and when they need to do to help you. And then going now to um, who is responsible for the taxes, are you responsible? So basically we have two set of taxes. We have employer related taxes and we have employee taxes. So since the program helps you create a business to hire a caregiver, business employer taxes are taken from the budget and paid on a quarterly basis. So public partnerships will file taxes on your behalf and no action is needed from you. And employer taxes varies. This information can be seen in your budget summary in the better online portal. Employee taxes are determined based on their W-2s and also are, they are taken out bi-weekly from their paycheck. And to identify the total, the employee may review their pay stops. So Donna, I'm gonna pass it right back to you to uh, wrap it up. Thank, thank you, Rachel. Uh, I know this is a lot of information and I think, you know, as Mercedes said, thankfully we are recording this and you can go back and listen and go over the details. But really as consult consultants um, at PPL, we provide support frequently throughout the participants enrollment in the program. The support may come from scheduled contacts such as monthly or quarterly calls or visits. You know, with the pandemic, we're doing the call, we're doing calls, and hopefully we'll get back to, um, a, you know, a new normal and do our in-person visits. But, you know, you can certainly, if you have ad hoc questions, you can certainly go to your consultant and work with them and ask them, you know, to help you um, manage through an issue or a concern or just some kind of a training need or any kind of ad hoc questions. So when you're first enrolling in the program, the participant is assigned a consultant who will review the rights and responsibilities of their role. Um, the information is very lengthy, therefore um, they'll provide monthly calls during the first six months of the program to make sure everything is clear and we provide additional support if needed. Uh, a consultant will also complete a quarterly visit every three months. Uh, during these visits, we'll ask routine questions, provide updates and more. Topics such as budget authority, employer authority, timesheet submissions routinely reviewed with the participant and any other person they may want to include in the conversation. You know, like we said, you know, you don't have to do this alone, we're all together. Being an employer can be scary. However, with the help of a consultant, the participant can be successful in self directing their care. So hopefully that answers those questions, Mercedes. Yeah, there, 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 there's a lot, there's a lot there, Donna and Rachel, and appreciate your um, stepping through what the role of the consultant is. Um, and I know that at the session on this Thursday, there's even more in-depth um, conversation about the role at, at PPL. So thank you for yep. highlighting the consulting aspect. Um, and you're right. We're you know we're not in this alone. We're in this together, and we appreciate the the advice and information that consultants can bring to um, this part of the the self directed services. Um, so thank you. Um, we're going to move thank into you. we're going to move into support coordination. Um, we have three. You know, PPL is the only uh, consultant. You won't have a different. You don't get to choose one necessarily, it's all happens within PPL, but in the DDD system, 
with support coordination, there are support coordination agencies that individuals um, can make a selection from. Um, so we invited three different support coordination units into this session tonight. We have Christina Rapizzi with Values into Action. We have Amy Watts um, with Neighbors and we have Rachel Bernini with Sam. So I see you're all there on the screen, great. Um, so you're gonna each take a, a turn at answering the question about what would you say is the most valuable assistance or service that a support coordinate, coordinator provides to a person and their family when considering self-direction? Um, so this could be somebody who's using it or probably more so somebody who's, you know, doesn't really know about it yet. Can you tell us um, what's the kind of assistance that a support coordinator can provide in explaining self-direction and helping a person understand what's involved? And I think, Amy, we're going to start with you. I'll get us started. Thank you so much for your time this evening. I appreciate everyone coming out. Um, I've had families tell me when they first come into the self-directed service or kind of adult services that it felt like they, they fell off this cliff and kind of don't know what it is that's going on. So I'd say your support coordinator is that person that's sort of on the bottom of that ravine who picks you up, dusts you off, and then helps you kind of continue on. Um, one of the wonderful things your support coordinator can do for you, one of the great services we provide is that we answer questions and we're, and we're there. So as you've noticed, there's sort of the, AB, the ABC alphabet soup of support services. Your support coordinator is someone that can, can define and can explain and can help you navigate these systems that are there that are wonderful, but because they're wonderful and so rich, they're also very complicated. Um, even if you are shifting support coordination agencies, because as Steve well, you know, well aptly said, uh, it's about choices. So you can even do a choice of a support coordination agency. So if that support coordinator or even just that agency's mission, vision, and values isn't really matching what works for you, you can go find one that does. But then you're sort of starting the relationships all over again. Um, I've heard from my families uh, when we've done some surveys is one of the things that they greatly appreciate is that we answer the phone. So uh, I get the, the wonderful phone calls that are like, you know, I, I don't know if you can help me with this, but you're the one that answers. So, so I'm going to call it and I'm going to see if we, if we can just talk this through or, or figure it out. And I, I wish the families that call me were calling me with a wonderful um, story about their, their vacation or a great recipe for apple pie, but they're usually not. They're calling because they have a problem or something that needs to be figured out and thought through. And even if I don't have an answer, I find that they appreciate that, um, that I'll go find it. So either I find another person for them to talk to or I find another resource for them to do. Even if I don't have an answer, I try to connect them to somebody who does have the answer. And I think that's just knowing that you can pick up the phone and call a person and get that is, it feels really good, especially if someone who's trying to, as I said, navigate a somewhat complicated system. And I know Christina's got even more to expand on that. Thanks, Amy. So support coordination in, in my mind and what we do every day is really being that partner to help reach your true vision in life for self-direction. So we're like your sidekick throughout the process. We're connecting you to both paid and unpaid services, helping you talk through your thoughts and ideas, and then putting them into action. And as Amy had mentioned, it can be very overwhelming. There's a lot coming at you, especially being new to the system and starting, you know, at the very first step, there's all of these questions and ideas thrown at you. So support coordination really breaks that down for you and walks you through each step. So you may have a plan for your life and a vision for your life, but then we help break that apart and start, okay, first, let's get this together. Once you're comfortable and confident doing A, then let's move to the second part. And then we may connect you to a different um, surf, uh, service or community resource. And then from there, once you get comfortable with that, then we'll move on to the next thing. And say you want to change your mind at any time and something's not working for you, 
you change your mind, you thought you'd like cooking class and now you really hate cooking and you wanna take art class. And then you take art class and you figure out, I hate art, I just wanna go do some yoga. We're gonna help you pick that apart and take, take it step by step. Um, and really with all of the panelists that are here, we're linking you to, to all of these wonderful services. So we're really that person that you're gonna pick up the phone and call and say, where do I get started? I wanna tell you how I'm feeling and then you kind of point me in the direction and then I'll you know, run with it and, and see what happens. Um, so really we're linking you to, every, to everyone, both paid, unpaid, um, talking about life challenges, things you wanna do. Um, and I'm sure Rachel has more and I don't wanna take up more time because I know we have a lot of people to talk. So I will hand it over to Rachel. Thanks, Christina and Amy. And I think to kind of bring together what Amy and Christina and, and all of us as support coordinators are really here to do is really providing that support and being competent with that support. Um, sports coordinators must have a working knowledge of the self-direction model, how it, how you can choose it, who, who does it, the control and the responsibility that's all associated with self-direction. Um, beyond um, knowledge, supports coordinators must also have a belief a belief in the model, not only is self-direction a viable model of service, but in many cases it's necessary for a lot of individuals and families. Um, and certainly the competency allows support coordinators to build relationships with individuals and families. And to be, and to be competent support coordinators, uh, we must actively listen, collaborate, and be resourceful so that ultimately everyone supported is left better off and living their best life. You're muted, Mercedes. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna touch the mouse anymore <laughs> because the mouse just got the best of me. Uh, my clicking went too fast. Thank you, Rachel, um, Amy, and Christina. Uh, you've, you've given us um, each your perspective, but um, you've come down to the fact that you know, your support coordinator is really an ally with you, right? You're, you're the person who can step through um, the challenges and hopefully the, the times to celebrate um, uh, your life. So we appreciate that. But I think it was Christina who said, you know, it can be overwhelming, right? And um, that was my cue in terms of segueing to the next part of this panel, which is around supports broker um, and the role of the support broker, because the support coordinator has a bandwidth with individuals and families that they can go so far. Um, and then um, some folks need a little bit more than that support coordinator can provide. Um, so... Jen Brown, um, she has, is joining us tonight from Eros Group, um, a support brokerage agency. And um, she's gonna take us through that step, you know, um, that next, what somebody needs beyond support coordination. Um, so I'm gonna ask Jen, if you could kind of just describe for us the most requested support broker service and why you think this is the, you know, that might be the one, and maybe there's more than one, Jen. Um, <laughs> but but let's start with one. Okay. Uh, so I gave a lot of thought to this question, and I talked to some colleagues and coworkers, and the consensus that um, that we came up with with the most requested support broker service. It's a combination of finding support staff while connecting people to their community and all it offers. We spend a good deal of time matching people with self-directed employees that live close by to them, and share the common interests. We assist people in interviewing and following um, through with issues of uh, scheduling and managing their staff once they're onboarded. And then we serve as a resource to the person and their staff. That's where we spend, um, spend a bulk of our time. But right now we support about 85 people and 90% of them um, we're finding staff and connecting them to their community. But this is only a small part of the answer and what we do as brokers. So in the manual, it states that we serving as the agent of the participant or family, the service is available to assist in identifying immediate and long-term needs, developing options to meet those needs, and accessing identified supports and services. 
It is in doing the work to identify the immediate and long-term needs that we often discover the most asked question. We spend a good deal of time getting to know the person and strengthen and help them strengthen their circle of support. It's really about creating a safe space for the question to bubble up to the surface. In the long run, it does no good to provide any support brokerage service without having these conversations. And we use a variety of person-centered planning tools, including maps and paths, charting the life course, and the Liberty Plan, just to name a few. See, because services can help someone attain their dreams, services are a tool to help you get there, but services can't provide a good life. They can only play a part of it. It's the balance of what's important to a person and what's important for a person. And with that balance, the, the, the comes this question, right? This question comes from a place of uncertainty and fear for the future. This fear and uncertainty can create a block to moving forward. So sometimes when we find, we get into a situation where we're finding staff for somebody, we're noticing things, right? Like maybe a large turnover in the staff or some other things. And so we dig deeper. And you guys, Mercedes, you already kind of talked about this with, with Patty Kowalczyk, right? It's the, the question is, who will support my loved one self-directing when I'm gone? What does this look like when the primary caregiver is no longer with us, right? There's so much natural support built into self-direction. When it goes away, what's left? Who's there? So we spend a great deal of time um, developing their circles of support that Patty and, and Steve talked about, strengthening them, broadening them, connecting people to their community, creating an interdependence, right? It's Judy, go back to Judy's words, right? It's, it's not about an independence. It's that interdependence that, we, that we, we help strengthen. But we don't create a dependency on supports brokerage because then we're just another service. And with you know, being just another service in the system, it's not what, you know, it's not what brings that, that, that good life, right? That meaningful life. So on paper, it may look like the most requested service is finding staff and connecting to the community. And it is like creating that space for people to show up in their communities and share their gifts and to bring into the community things that the community doesn't even know they're missing. But when we do support brokerage well, we get to the heart of the matter. And that's what makes a support brokerage so important to self-direction. Is, is to help answer that question of what happens when, um, and thanks so much for bringing it up before because that's really that's really the, the service, the work that we do. Well, th thanks, Jen. And um, if I could also point out that in the PPP system, the, the consultant is part of the package, right? So we've got the fiscal work that the, um, um, the program provides and then the consulting work. In DDD, the support, the support coordinator is part of the package. You have a support coordinator, you've, you've got to select a support coordinator to work with in the DDD system, and it's part of the package. Support brokering it does become a service, a, a, a billable service in the sure. system. So you're going to have to designate some funding to do that, but from folks that I've spoken with that have, 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 have um, included support brokering in their plans, um, that's what's making it work. Um, so it's an, it, 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 so Jen, do you want, just want to just take a minute on that? Because there is a choice that someone has to make to include it and include it with a cost that might come along with it. Sure. I, I, I mean, I agree with what you're saying. When we work in conjunction with support coordination, um, I think it, it brings the best of the service system to life, right? It's, when we have support brokers or support coordinators that we work with that really understand self-direction and, and are doing the, the good work of, of planning with the person at the center. And then we come along, it's like, you know, it's like left hand, right hand, right? We work together and we really um, support the person in a, in, a, in a meaningful way that wouldn't happen if we weren't working together. Um, I can think of several examples where, you know, we show up, um, and we, we do some things that, you know, the support coordinators are tasked with so much. Um, and it feels very much like, you know, as we get deeper into the fee for service, it's more and more. Um, and so we're able to take some of that off of their, um, you know, off of their plate, if you will, um, and develop relationships with the family and strengthen their relationship with the support coordinator and make it so that they're starting to use them more effectively as well. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm loving it, love, you know, doing the work and, um, I've seen, I've seen great results with it. Um, again, you know, it's, it's something that it really needs to be supported on, 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 by the support coordinator as well to, to really make it effective. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very promising. Um, and it, it's, I feel like it's the answer to the question, what happens when I'm not here for my son anymore. Right. So thanks, I'm Jen. <laughs> thanks, Jen. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. No your... Thank you for the time. Thank you. Um, so, you know, all of what we've talked about tonight, we don't get very far without the self-directed employee, um, the person in the system who's doing the work, supporting our, our loved one, supporting us um, in the system. So, um, Joe Wagner, so happy that you're with us tonight. Good evening. Uh, appreciate your being here. Um, and we're going to ask you to tell us kind of how you learned about an opportunity to be a self-hire and why did you pursue this opportunity? Um, why are you doing it? Why are you still doing it? Right. Um, well, I, I retired as a, as a corporate consultant and trainer about in late 2018, and I was looking how I can follow my passion. And one of my passions is percussion and drums. So I was invited to a drum circle that was sponsored by uh, the autistic community. And when I started learning more about the community and more about there's a need for direct supports or self-directed employees, that's how I became involved. So I really wanted to follow that passion. I was a, uh, still am, uh, belong to Big Brothers Big Sisters. So I mentored four young men. So I was wondering how can I take my transferable skills I learned from corporate, but also through Big Brothers Big Sisters and support people that, that need assistance. So Joe, you are the, um, you know, in my opening uh, segment, I was talking about people who wind up in the self as, as self-directed employees that may not have ever, you know, wanted to work at a provider or understood the track of being hired at a provider agency. So you, you know, retired from a, a successful career and then found this um opportunity as you said you explored the drum circle so tell, tell us like what you know what in this next chapter has been you know a real important aspect of of the work that you're doing well i, I find there's a need in the community that's something i really want to do in my retirement in some my retirement if you will and working more hours probably uh, but i if i became a uh, job coach through bong center training so i want to continue to learn um, I went through charting the life to be uh, an ambassador, so I really want to continue to learn and, and grow in this in this community and find out uh, how I can provide some support. If you see the banner behind me, I also joined the, the collaborative on the interactive map facilitator. So if you're looking for SDEs, that's a great place to go. So I just want to continue to learn. That's why I, I'm, I'm really privileged to be on the board. And I thank you for the opportunity. Well, th thanks, Joe, and, and we're going to clone you at the end of this session, if that's okay. Okay. <laughs> thanks. Um, <laughs> I appreciate that. So to wrap up our panel um, session, we have our two fiscal intermediaries, our um, Jocelyn Summers, who's here representing Easter Seals, New Jersey. Uh, she's the operations manager, and we have Ken Smith, who is with Public Partnerships. Um, so we're going to start with um, Jocelyn. And I'm going to ask you, Jocelyn, if you could um, talk to us about how individuals with IDD and their families are supported in Easter Seals on a daily basis. And um, if you could mention how you onboard a new self-directed employee and about how long that takes. I've heard that question out there. Okay, what a wonderful question to ask for cities. And I'm more than happy to explain agency with choices process to onboard a new self-directed employee. Agency with Choice supports its individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities and their families by providing high quality customer service. Our Agency with Choice customer service representatives pride themselves on upholding the Easter Seals team values, which are respectfulness, warmth, and expertise. This team is staffed with local residents who like to support their community and the people in them. From the moment an individual and their family chooses agency, agency with choice as their fiscal intermediary model, a customer service representative is there to guide them through the process. 
Currently, we have two avenues that an individual can go through, which are transitioning from Easter Seals old fiscal intermediary model to the new agency of choice program or the new enrollment where the individual is brand new to the financial management services fiscal intermediary model. When an individual transitions from Easter Seals old fiscal intermediary model into the new financial management services model agency of choice, an experienced and knowledgeable customer service representative contacts the managing employer and reviews the transitioning process with them. They inform the managing employer um, um, the steps associated with transitioning into agency of choice, which include the receipt of the agency of choice welcome letter, managing employer review guide, how to complete documents through Adobe Sign, who to contact, answer any general questions about the program and the average time it should take for their individual's plan to be active in agency of choice. The average turnaround time for an individual to transition into agency of choice is about eight to 10 business days for the fiscal intermediary model. When an individual and their family chooses agency of choice as their fiscal intermediary model and are not already a part of the agency of choice family, their staff must go through a new hire process conducted by an agency of choice human resources onboarding specialist. Once our agency with choice team receives the individual's demographics, a customer service representative will contact the managing employer to fill out a new hire application request form on their behalf. During this time, the customer service representative collects potential staff, contact information, and submits the application. After the agency with choice human resources team receives the new hire application request form, it'll take about five business days to onboard the staff. Simultaneously, our agency of choice verification team is preparing and sending out the enrollment documents to the individual, family, and their self-directed employee for completion. The enrollment process for a new individual into agency of choice can take about eight to 10 business days once they're onboarded into our system. The transitioning process into agency of choice is a bit shorter than the new enrollment process because the staff are already in our systems and do not need to go through our human resources new hire process. We here at Agency with Choice aim to make the transition and enrollment process as smooth and easy as possible because we understand that our consumers deserve not to have their services and supports interrupted. An individual family and staff who are part of the Agency with Choice family will always be able to contact a customer service representative via phone or email. With our state-of-the-art Zendesk ticketing system, customer service representatives can accurately document phone calls for the best quality assurance. They also make it a priority to respond to all inquiries they receive through email, phone call, or voicemail within 24 hours. We have also implemented a follow-up process that requires the customer service team to follow up on any question, comment, or concern the individual family or staff have to make sure that they've got the clarified answers. This ensures that all individuals, families, and their self-directed employees' concerns are being addressed in an appropriate time frame. Thank you. Excellent, Jocelyn, thank you so much. Um, okay. And Ann Smith with PPL, we're gonna ask you the same question about how the individual and their families are supported by PPL outside of the role of the consultant, which we already heard about. And, and then could, could, if you could also talk about that onboarding a new self-directed employee, um, that'd be great, Ken. Absolutely, Mercedes, happy to. And I just wanna mention that Suzanne Crisp from our team is with me here as well. So we'll tag team a bit here. Okay, uh, thanks. Great. So um, in the DDD program, uh, much like the PPP program, we do offer uh, more of a, a, a tailored approach to helping the, the individual and their employee on board. Um, and it's, it was mentioned earlier that in PPP, the personal preference program, it's what we call the consultant. But with the DDD program, uh, PPP offers enrollment support to all individuals and employers of record um, that are referred to PPL. So what this includes is a welcome introductory call. And in that call, we schedule an enrollment walkthrough 
Then we complete the enrollment walkthrough with the employer record and the self-directed employee to make sure we get them set up. And then we, we take questions and make sure that they're very comfortable and that we offer the support that they're inviting, that, that they're choosing to have. It's really important in the FEA model, uh, fiscal employer agent or fiscal intermediary, that we're not doing more than an individual is requesting, asking for, because it's, it then becomes less empowering if, if you're just uh, almost acting like an agency, you know, providing all these services when this individual has actually chosen self-direction. So um, then at, at PPL, we have an enrollment processing team in the background that takes all this work um, that our enrollment support has done with the individual. And we process the paperwork and we update all of the, the checklist of the various items, the I-9, the W-4 in our system. And once the employer of record is ready to start, then we have the workers' compensation that we have to process. And we then communicate the billable rate from the individual's budget to the support coordinator. And we heard from the support coordinators earlier. So it's quite a few steps there. And the workers' comp can be um, one of the longer and one of the more complicated ones. So we really make sure that the enrollment support person for DDD is shepherding that and making sure, you know, where there might be a bump in the road with the workers' comp policy uh, purchase that we're there to help walk it through. So to answer your question, Mercedes, about timeline, so all of these steps takes about two and a half weeks for the employer of record, and then the self-directed employee enrollment takes about one to two weeks. So what we're doing, though, is making that concurrent, so it's not sequential. And then sure. Su Suzanne, would you offer a color or additional details or a little bit more thoughts than, than what I provided? Sure. sure. I just want to say that the, the level of uh, efficiency that the supports offer, and by supports, we're talking about the financial management services, whether it's FEA or whether it's uh, agency with choice, um, has a lot to do with how, um, how the individual feels about enrollment. Are they confused? It, it is a daunting process and PPL doesn't make it a daunting process. We have the uh, Department of Labor and IRS that helps us make it, <laughs> it all a, a, a daunting progress. But um, the, the efficiency and effectiveness of the supports that we provide uh, does help the individual enjoy the experience of self-direction. It lets him or her concentrate on managing the worker, getting the things that they need. Um, and, then, and then either the agency with choice or, or PPL make sure everything else is running smoothly. The only other thing I'll say is that um, we at PPL Thank you all so much for inviting us to this this uh, um, the uh, conference. Um, it has given us new perspective, a, a renewed spirit of of uh, partnership, and we so thank you for doing that. And hope we can be a part of things, more things to come in the future. Well, thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Jocelyn. And none of you are off the hook. Okay, this panel has been excellent, but. Um, your good work will come with some punishment because we'll help you have you come back to other sessions this month in March. You won't get off the hook that easy. Wow, we certainly covered a lot of turf tonight. Um, again, these were, I'll call these, these the, like the snippets of um, what the rest of the month will, will, will bring to you. Um, part two this Thursday from noon to um, 6 p.m., Look at those sessions at the site, um, on the website for the self-direction conference, select all of them and register for all or what you think you need more in-depth information about. And then the rest of the sessions this month, please um, come back. Remember that this is recorded um, and we're able to, um, you'll be able to watch it on demand. Um, we also, um, want to make sure that we got to your questions. And I see that because of this great panel, a lot of the questions were answered as we went along. Um, we are at the end of our time now, but anything that did not get answered, we will make sure that we uh, feedback to the, to the planning team and we'll make sure that um, we cover it in the sessions um, that you can participate in between now and the end of March. So 
Um, congratulations, panel. You all did a great job. Thank you, participants, uh, attendees, for, for listening in. There's so many of you. We appreciate it. And we are. Um, this is just the beginning. We look forward to seeing you all at the upcoming sessions in March. So yeah. thank you, Sign Language Interpreters. Thank you both very much. Um, we appreciate your time tonight as well. Bye, everybody. Bye now.